uh, and one of them was also Voices in the Dark. Uh, I won't uh, talk too much about Voices in the Dark, uh, although it's a very interesting novel. It belongs to a trilogy. Uh, the trilogy consists of uh, Voices in the Dark, which in my opinion is the best one, um, Austeria. Austeria, if you don't know, is the place where uh, you know Jews uh, in ancient Poland could come and have something to eat and drink, more or less, to have some fun. Um, also to dance. And uh, the third part is uh, Sen Azrila, the Az Azril's dream, Azril's name. And uh, since my, one of my students wanted to write a thesis uh, under my supervision, you know, about Strykowski and I read all the voices in the dark and Austeria, I had to read uh, Azril's dreams also. And I thought that it would be on the same level. Unfortunately, it was so boring. It was, <laughs> in, it's incredibly boring, this novel. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe if you study uh, Jewish traditions, maybe it's interesting for you because all his books represent Jewish traditions. And this is uh, what I would call in Freudian terms the, the grand return of the repressed, okay? As, as I was sketching the whole uh, story of uh, Strykowski's uh, rejecting Jewish tradition, right? His uh, most important novels uh, all represent the dead world of, uh, that, that did not exist at that time of Jewish customs, of Jewish traditions. Okay, it's a critical vision of it, probably, but it's a kind of, it's a, you know, uh, love and hate relationship because, um, because um, you know, uh, he's critical about very many things uh, in, in Jewish tradition, but he's, uh, and he personally did not feel a part of it anymore, but he's, it, it is his main theme, it's like, like he can't write about anything else for years. He came out for years. Uh, at the age of 91, <laughs> because he was born in uh, 19, 1905, okay? And uh, he came out, no, I, I can't count, so sorry, he, he, he was probably 88 or something. Uh, you, you'll find out in a moment, because he came out in 1993. 1993 minus 1905 makes, I guess, 88, right? Uh, anyway, <laughs> he was not a, a young person at that moment, and uh, of course uh, he spent most of his uh, life in the Poland of the 20s and the 30s, and then uh, the communist uh, Poland, and came out in different conditions. In 1993, uh, where the communism was over, and it was probably, you could say, you could believe, uh, more easy to come out, but uh, but the truth is it wasn't still. I mean, uh, he gave an interview. He came out through a novella, okay, which is uh, just interesting. But uh, the novella was instantly uh, followed by a by a press interview, which was very important because it gives another context. He said something very significant, I believe, because he said. You're so old. I mean, it was like he was talking to himself, okay? You're so old. You were silent about this for so many years. Uh, you should say that very thing and then stop talking at all. This is very significant because it's like uh, preparing to, to, to die, you know? I must confess the truth that I've been hiding for so many times and now I can die. Now I can die and speak no more. It's like declaring oneself homosexuality was something so dreadful that after that you, 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 you cannot speak at all. This is very significant for the thinking of, um, of, uh, of, of Polish people about homosexuality uh, specifically, but also it says something about the atmosphere of the 90s, right? So the novel, novella, that he came out with uh, was actually called Milczenie. There is no good translation of that into English and probably into other languages as well because, uh, well, it could mean silence, but silence is something else. Because silence, you know, is, is when uh, nobody speaks because, for, for example, there's nobody in the room. So it could be rather keeping silence, like being mute, but it's something between being mute and keeping silence or being dumb being not allowed to speak, okay? So this is, this is the idea, and this, that's why the, the, the commentary uh, in the interview is so important about that, also. Um, so uh, he came out with this novella, and this novella is very interesting because he 
combine somehow his Jewish identity with, um, with homosexuality. What he says is, as a young boy, he was in love with a Polish girl who he knew from the university. They both studied Polish philology. It was in the 20s, or no, in the 30s, more or less. And, uh, and he was more or less accepted by the family, you know, which was not so obvious uh, in the 30s because if you were a Jew and you had a very strict, let's say, Catholic family, Polish family, then the family would not accept, for example, a Jewish fiancé, but um, in this case it was okay. Um, anyway, they did not sleep together, as you can guess from what he's saying, because he's not very direct in this novella. Uh, but uh, he also tells about his engagement in communism. So he combines uh, layers of his, uh, you know, identity, uh, which uh, eventually lead to, to, to this, the discovery of his queerness. It happened in, it happened in Palestine because as a communist uh, he went to and Palestine. And boy, in the 30s. I think he must have been, well, twenty, maximum. I, I tried to, I tried to, you know, represent this kind of. Uh, he had glasses, but I can't wear glasses because if I wear glasses, I don't look twenty. Okay. Uh, so, so he was walking like that and was like, walking the other way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, this kind of thing happened. I did not respond very interestingly, but, but what, happened, what happened next? Tsiolkovsky did not know what was happening. And the guy started following uh, to the hotel or the place Tsiolkovsky was staying, okay? And they started talking. And the, the Palestinian, or the, the, the Jew from Palestine, you know, Tostrykowski, I knew from the, first, from the start that you are one of us. One of us, said Tostrykowski, meaning what? <laughs> well, that you have desires that I could share. <laughs> and Tostrykowski was shocked because he never thought of himself as, a, as such a person, as a queer person, and uh, he never had an idea that it could be recognized on the street. And this is very interesting. Well, we don't know if the consumption uh, took place, okay, because he's discreet about that. Uh, but since that moment, this is how he uh, tells that, that he knew, right, about himself. And, um, okay, uh, I'll come back to, to, to the uh, history of Sodom and its religions and traditions in a moment, but I'll just uh, say that uh, the interpretation that, story, that the story about Sodom means uh, the rejection that the Christian, the, 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 mm, yeah, the Christian rejection of homosexuality uh, was being built for years, but the, the most strong uh, representation of it comes from the 14th century, because the English law used the word sodomy as, uh, as re referred to homosexual acts that were prohibited. So from the 14th century, we have the tradition of judicial persecution of homosexuals under the name not only homosexuals, uh, but uh, also homosexuals under the name of sodomy. And there are some other uh, uh, words that describe uh, homosexuality under the name Sodom, uh, which, uh, which are vitium sodomiticum, peccatum, or crimen uh, sodomiticum, right? Um, vitium contra naturam, or peccatum contra naturam, like the sin against nature which is, a, as Boswell explains, it's actually a translation of the St. Paul's expression paraphysin, and paraphysin does not mean contra, contra naturam, it means like uh, a, step, a step apart, okay? Which is not the same, but anyway, so it's a wrong translation. And then we have peccatum mutum, peccatum mutum, which is dumb sin. And uh, I'll read from this book that I borrowed from your library. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And the everyday reality and persecution of homosexuals in the Middle Ages. I'll read a paragraph that is uh, significant in our context and also in context of uh, Strykowski's both coming out and the drama. Peccatum mutum dam sin. High and late medieval theologians such as Paris Bishop Guillaume d'Auvergne also dated these taboo terms back to St. Paul and in fact to his term passio ignominie shameful passion. Okay, uh, so this word passio ignominia, it, it, etymolo it, etymologically it meant shameful pa uh, passion, but it was understood the other way. The noun ignominia was interpreted in the etymological sense as unmentiona unmentionability, 
ignominian, something that ign, like you cannot, nominian, name, right? But it meant shameful passion. Anyway, uh, and as a prohibition by the apostle on assigning a specific term to this sin. Otherwise, authors gladly cited Pope Gregory I, the Great, who had warned priests against speaking on these matters, as well as the Bible translator Hieronymus, who had interpreted the toponym Sodom etymologically as dumb animals. Uh, the finite, definite sorry, the theological explanation of the term dumb sin was accordingly not necessary, so that the individual theologians could develop according to their wish and mood. The well-known late medieval penitential preacher Bertolt von Regensburg regards the dumb sin, which he also calls the red or the crying sin, as the summit of all offenses. He prohibits himself from spreading further information about it. Many startled believers were in fact not in a position to interpret the preacher's allusions and full of scruples turned to the preacher with the words, Brother Berthold, we do not know what you mean. To this he replied laconically, You see, this is what I want most of all. This thing, however, he added mysteriously, is so frightful that neither God nor man, not even the devil in hell, could give it a name. As a result of it, five powerful cities were once reduced to rubble and ashes, and anyone who is stained with it is like an outcast who is forbidden to touch dishes and food. Um, I think I've also seen a, another version in, in Latin, but my Latin is quite weak. I'll, I think it, it went like this. Okay, I'm not concentrated. Illud, no, illud crimen quid uh, inter homini non nominandum est. Something like that. I guess you, you yeah, you, you, you understand that this is a horrible sin that should not be named among Christians, more or less. M meaning homosexuality, that is a sodomy, okay? All right. Hello ladies and gentlemen and the others, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'll put that back because uh, I want you to see me. I mean, uh, also hear me if I could do something with the mic. I can take it into my head, right? No, I can't. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm struggling with te technique, so... Um, it's okay. So, I would like to... Um, tell you that right now in Poland we are facing a wave of secret diaries written by homosexual writers. I think it's a unique phenomenon because uh, every year, almost every year, we have another uh, diary. It started with um, diaries which were not officially so secret by Jarosław Wyboszkiewicz. Um, then, in 2012, we uh, had the publication of a secret diary by Miron Białoszewski. And a secret diary is, is, is the title, exactly. Uh, we all knew that uh, Białoszewski has a secret diary because it was announced years before. And um, it was also known that uh, this diary cannot be published until 2010. So we were all waiting, and we were wondering, you know, the, the, the increasing interest why he <coughs> decided not to publish this diary. The, the official explanation that, uh, that, 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 that many people believed in was that uh, it's going to reveal many facts about the homosexual life in Poland um, during the communism, and that Białoszewski did not want, I mean, he wanted to wait uh, for, for, for the people whom it might, uh, might concern um, to die uh, so that uh, th those informations can be safely made public. But I, don't be I, I, I haven't believed in that uh, um, version. My interpretation was that uh, Białoszewski, when he died in 1983, was unsure if his uh, life work will survive, will be still interesting. So. Um, in 2010, like 20 years after his death, he would revive the memory of which he was unsure about himself. 20 years in Argentina, it's only 
is only voice. He has a special way of writing, and the Polish editors, actually, of Kronos did not understand that thing. He writes, Chico slash A, meaning Chico or Chica, or Muchacho slash A, Muchacho or Muchacha. In this case, he never means girls, and this is the thing that the Polish editors did not understand. Uh, what does he mean then? Well, he, 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 he tries to, probably, to say something about the so-called effeminate boys. But my opinion is that in Poland there has never, there, 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 there was uh, no such a phenomenon as in Latin America. This phenomenon is called travesty. Travesty is not exactly the same thing as tra transvestite uh, or drag queens in, in, in Europe. In, in, in Latin America, tra travesties is not also exactly the same thing as the third sex, for example, in, 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 in Asia, right? In, in India or in Thailand, it's not the same thing, but more or less. It's more or less, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of subculture of men who dress as women and behave in an effeminate way, okay? And because Gombrowicz had no language for that, I believe, he tried to signal it with this O slash A, meaning that, like something between genres, right? Um, okay, so, so we know that he had sex with uh, effeminate boys, but mostly he was attracted to sailors and to people of um, to boys of, you know, let's say, proletarian professions. But the thing that, that he so usually notes what they, uh, what they did and you, you must remember that he picked them in parks, you know, mostly in Lezama Park or in uh, Retiro. Uh, they had sex um, in parks. Uh, now, a question about Konos, because that's also, obviously that hasn't been translated and it hasn't been spoken so much about it here in Norway, but what was the reception in Poland? Because it came out in May 2013 mm -hmm. and, yeah, what was the expectations to Kronos and... Well, the expectations were high, and it was <clears throat> obviously supported by the editor who wanted to sell the book. So, so you know, there were, the, the whole, whole Poland was full of uh, bus stops and posters. The biggest uh, literary event in Poland of the 21st century. Okay. And then this disappointment in the press, you know. <laughs> there's, there's, there's interviews by Rita Gombr with, with Rita Gombrowicz who said that this is the raw, the true Gombrowicz, etc., etc., and then people read it and with the faces like, what is that, you know? <laughs> why, why do we need to read such a thing? I mean, it could, could have been written by anybody. You don't, you don't need to be a writer to, to write such things. And who cares about his diseases, actually, and, and how much he earned? You know, what are we supposed to do with it? It doesn't give us any in, uh, information. Of course, it requires reading, you know, I, I would say it requires a queer eye, you know, to it. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, still, my opinion is that it's a boring book, actually. If I, I, I fortunately did not have to buy it myself because I got an, you know, exemplar as a reviewer. But if I had to pay, okay, this, for you this is not very much, but it would be like, I don't know, uh, how much does it cost in Poland? It's 40 is what, so it's uh, a, a, 80, 80 yeah. Yeah, don't buy it. Right. Well, I, I, would, I would think about it for a long time. If, do, do I really want to have it on my shelf, you know? Mm. Okay. Could, I, could I just add, because, you know, just quoted from the book, you know, very well quoted. But you're right, you know, the first, the, the, the pages that cover the years up to his uh, voyage, by sea, he wrote those recalling from it. He was in, in that was in 1950s in Argentina. So he said, "Okay, I have to." So, you know, back. in hiding, I was trying to pretend I'm so serious, but I can't stand that anymore. So I can I would like to say something very important. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, as you know, I mean, there are, there are things you know, and there are things you don't yet. As you know, Agnes is a great translator, but she's a former ballet dancer. Okay, Knut is a professor of literature, 
but he had a career as a stage director in the theater. Okay, right, now me. Well, I used to be a singer. I haven't finished yet. So, it's just a moment before the official conference press, but you'll be the first to hear it. We decided to make a musical out of Kronos. <laughs> With Knut as the mature Gombrowicz, me, me as the sailor, look at my blue jacket, it's, for, it's, it's on purpose today, and Agnes will be the hairy ballet, ballet dancer, because in Gombrowicz it's only hairy ballet dancer, so we'll, I don't know, we cut some beard, we'll grow beards with Knut and cut them and cover Agnes in them, and she'll be dancing. <laughs> so, and, and all the ballet dancer has like really tacky jewelry, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we, I want to address it the part. Yeah, yeah, we are rehearsing right now. So I'll be singing, you know, Marinero, Marinero, si, a, a disco song from the 80s. Knut will be looking at me with desire, and Agnes will be dancing around. And we, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be huge. We're going to present it in Poland. We're going to present it in Oslo Opera House. Okay, be there. <laughs> Borczyk, who is a scholar from Poland. He is a lecturer at the Jagiellonian University and an assistant professor at the Academy of Science in Warsaw. He has published several books and many articles. Uh, he has been, uh, during his visit here in Oslo, he has been giving a series of uh, lectures on modern, on Polish queer modernism. And today's title is, uh, maybe a bit enigmatic for some of you, uh, for others maybe less so, it's called uh, a Polish gay gothic, Jerzy Andrzejewski. Mm -hmm. So, so well, you can proceed. Thank you. Do you, do, you, do you think I need to use the microphone or is it okay? Is it is alright without. If it is without, I can... <laughs> I, yes, I don't have to stand there and be hidden, okay? So it can be a little less formal. Maybe I could even take a seat here, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, Jerzy Andrzejewski was considered one of the biggest writers of the Polish modernism, after, especially after the Second World War. However, his, uh, after his death, his work constantly declined in the memory of Polish people and unfortunately little of his work stayed in the canon that people read at schools and for pleasure, if, if anybody reads for pleasure anymore <laughs> in, in Poland, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so. I will talk about some of his works in more detail, but first of all, this uh, concept of gay gothic or queer gothic should be explained. It's not my invention. Um, right now, like three years ago, for example, a book called Queer Gothic was published by George Haggerty, and there, there, there is another one about queer gothic um, in Victorian times. Mm, also pu book published, scientific book, but mainly the, the researcher who introduced uh, the idea that Gothic novels, English Gothic novels, have something to do with homosexuality and homophobia was Yves Kosowski Cedric, the pioneer of queer studies. And Yves Kosowski Cedric started her career actually exploring Gothic novels without thinking about homosexuality, queer studies, uh, etc., and gay studies. Um, that, that first book of hers, her, her PhD, was The Coherence of Gothic Conventions. But then she was working on her postdoc book and Knut said, don't go there. <laughs> And uh, I had no I, uh, intention, actually, of going to that. <laughs> but uh, we thought 
Or I don't know. Or or this uh, academic residence is so unpopular. Or, or I don't know. Or people are so rich that they can afford, you know, uh, uh, th three and four ho uh, stars host uh, hotels here in Oslo that they that they don't need it because I was the only person in in, in this academic residence. You know. <laughs> However, well, well, so we so we so we thought there were some people probably in this academic residence, but they are all dead. They lie in this cellar, you know. The, those stairs uh, that lead it down, they are all hidden there. We don't know how they died, but my fate was, uh, you know, predictable right now. In some days, I would also lie in the cellar. Okay. Then, I went to the toilet. Okay, here comes the controversial part. <laughs> I entered the toilet, and I thought, to myself, I'm alone in this house, I can relax. And then I started hearing voices. You know, voices like people in the house. I don't know who they were because there, were, there was absolutely nobody in the house. I think there were, there were ghosts, okay? Uh, th th those were the ghosts of, of dead academics and maybe even uh, of Jerzy Andrzejewski, um, who were very interested in what, what I was doing, you know, in this taboo, intimate situation. Of course, when I came out of the toilet, they disappeared. But the floor during the night was squeaking all the time. You might say it was the wind, but I'm not sure. All right, so we have the classical Gothic situation and the classical Freudian analysis serves it too. We have a spooky house and uh, we have a paranoid situation. And if Kosowski Cedric says, oh, okay, dead bodies downstairs, right? If Kosowski Cedric says, we all know the expression, to be 